Uh, that being said, uh, let's talk about uh, Mill5 for two seconds. Uh, Mill5 is a new company. It was founded in 2015 by myself and my business partner, Shri Bibuthi. Shri, right in the front row right here. Um, we're both a consulting and a product company. Um, we firmly believe that uh, we can help customers do innovative things with their business, but at the same time, along the way, we always find really cool ideas that we want to mature into our own products uh, and offer them to uh, our customers. So our focus is predominantly cloud, uh, mobile, and modern enterprise. Uh, we, just, we do work in multiple industries, so for example, we have several financial services customers here in the Boston area, but we also have healthcare customers throughout New England. And um, the current size of us is uh, six employees. We have three in the room right now. Uh, we do go beyond that six with contractors up to 10. So uh, we are early stage. We're brand spanking new and we are growing. Uh, the next thing about all this is that we are 100% self-funded. So a <clears throat> little bit about me. Uh, I am the chief architect and CTO of Mill5. Uh, I am also the former chief architect and CTO of Blue Metal slash Red Metal. Have you guys heard of that company before? Yes, a lot of people shaking their heads. So <clears throat> I left Blue Metal to form Mill5 with my friend Shri. Uh, I am an AWS uh, certified architect and developer. I'm also a Microsoft certified master, right? That means I know a lot. Uh, I was at Microsoft for 10 years. I left there to uh, do bigger and better things. So I'm also a published author. I've written some books, some articles, uh, and I'm a former professor at Drexel University. Okay, so enough about me. Let's talk about uh, Cloud Academy. They are helping sponsor tonight, so thank you to them. Uh, in honor of Mill 5's uh, culture of constant learning, this is one of the things that we look for in employees when we hire them to see do they have the passion to learn new things uh, constantly, right? Because technology is forever changing, and we really want to stay at the forefront of that technology. Uh, so we're always in learning mode. Um, with that, we reached out to Cloud Academy, and they were uh, very gracious enough to offer up one full year of uh, their product, right? So please put your business card in the bucket. Sri has the bucket at the front of the room. Uh, I'll ask again before we do the drawing to make sure that everybody has a chance to win. <coughs> Okay, so tonight, we're gonna to talk about the background of why we're developing this product. We're gonna get into th some things like deployment, service discovery, service routing, and scheduling. Um, along the way, we're gonna talk about some of the challenges we've had with using AWS, and what we've done to kind of work around them, right? So we've used things like Lambda and API Gateway and, and those type of products, and. We, we love those things, but we've, we've had to do some interesting things on our own. So we're going to talk about why we did those things, and maybe you've run into the same challenges that we've had. Right. <clears throat> so let's talk about some customers. We've had many customers come to us and say, hey, I got this intellectual property. It's written by my analysts, my engineers, uh, my quants, uh, my developers, and I need a way to expose it very quickly without it having to be a long development process. Um, a lot of times people just shut down immediately and they say, I don't want to go through that effort. So we've been approached by uh, several customers to say, hey, how do I take those assets, that IP, and expose it quickly? So some of the scenarios that we have right here on this slide are talking to those needs. So in the first example, I have an engineer. He needs to run simulations across a large data set. He has some you know, code that's doing something that gives him some results. And he needs to do it quickly, but he doesn't have the compute resources in order to do it. So we need to scale up those compute resources uh, using high performance computing techniques in order to get that job done uh, very easily. Uh, the second scenario is data, right? So data is king, right? It's the center of the universe. If you have data that you would like to expose to people, 
and then say you start charging for that data, how do you do that? All right, so we have many customers that want to say, hey, I have my IP is data, and I want to expose it as a service to uh, their customers. <coughs> Uh, the next one is algorithms, and this is probably the number one space that we see a lot of. Um, you got quants, scientists, engineers that have all developed these algorithms on things like MATLAB, R, Excel, right? Some other tool that isn't .NET, Java, Python. It isn't a development language, and they need a way to expose those things without writing any code. Right, so how do they do that? <clears throat> and then finally, you know, our friends, the developers. Uh, they are writing code in .NET, Java, Python, uh, maybe some other language. For us, these are the three that we're focusing on right now. And they have some interesting stuff, but they don't have the skill set to necessarily expose it as a service uh, in the cloud. So we've taken all these scenarios and said, this is an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity to unlock intellectual property that's just sitting there, not doing anything. Uh, it's an opportunity to take something, expose it with little or no development. It allows all those people I just mentioned to focus on business value, not infrastructure and not plumbing. Uh, one of my favorite sayings to developers is, we are value-add developers, we're not plumbers. Right? So, Let's focus less on the infrastructure and focus more on getting what the business is doing, exposed so you can actually start monetizing it, right? Take the intellectual property and make some money on it. And then finally, if you're in the business and your business is not cloud infrastructure, you want to pay a lot for that cloud infrastructure. You want to basically take the money, the value that is your service, uh, charge for it, and get that money back without actually spending it all on cloud infrastructure. So we took that and we started applying some tenants to this. The first one is microservices. How many people have heard of microservices? I think everybody in the room, right? It's right up there with uh, Docker as far as uh, words that people have heard about. Um, performance. So a lot of times I will see a quant or an engineer or a scientist and they code something up and it's fast, but some of the things that they're doing slow them down. So third party run times, certain overhead. So we're looking to provide some infrastructure to improve that performance so that they don't have significant development efforts. Then we want to provide some type of structure to this. So we're taking all the best practices that we know about development things like versioning and managing our deployments and doing continuous integration and continuous deployments and bringing that in the form of immutable infrastructure. So when you deploy something out there, it's there, it doesn't change, it's repeatable. And then lastly, uh, bringing in the tenants that you would expect from a cloud architecture. Uh, scale and demand, but often a lot of times I'll talk to architects and they'll tell me, hey, there's some really great whiz-bang thing that I could do in the cloud, but then I look at it and I'm like, well, this is going to cost a lot. Right? So we want to make sure that we architect the cost as well. Okay, so enter the Calculate service. Right? So for us, this is the architecture that we are building. What this is doing is allowing us to present services to any consumer that a customer may have. So we have a customer in New York. He likes building algorithms on MATLAB, right? So what he wants to do is he wants to say, hey, take that algorithm, make it a service in the cloud, and then just start charging for it, right? So <clears throat> how does he actually do that? So for us, we're using a number of different things here. The primary things on this slide that you should pay attention to are the ECS, um, that's the EC2 container service. And um, uh, the container management with the, uh, the container registry. And um, Elastic Load Balancer. We do have things like Lambda, 
um, and Route 53, but these are all services that are supporting the core here. So the main things on this slide are the service router and the cluster. The service router, for us, think of it like API Gateway. How many people are using API Gateway today? So three people, four people. Have you had any challenges with it? If you don't mind me asking, what kind of challenges? Uh, the initial configuration through the console. And uh, once I fix that, it shows to there for each uh, Terraform. Mm -hmm. uh, guarantee that it's passing the, the maintenance of the API. Uh, OK. Manually is a uh, kind of pain in the ass. <laughs> Um, what about Lambda? Anybody using Lambda? Okay. What are you using Lambda for? Uh, uh, well, yeah. we're using it for uh, an Alexa skill. Um, and <coughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So, um, so we're trying to use all these things, but when you look at this, what you'll find is <clears throat> uh, when we originally started out to build this infrastructure. We were really interested in using API Gateway and Lambda. Um, it seemed like it was going to be the big thing for us. And it still is. We really like those two products. But our customers had very specific needs that kind of were like 90%, maybe 95% of the way there. And that extra 5 to 10% was killing us. Right? So <clears throat> we actually worked around it. Right? So, um, so that being said, I'll come back to this slide. Uh, let's talk about what a customer experience would be uh, on our service. Uh, the first one is to create an application. Right? What you're going to do is you're going to come to our portal, you're going to sign up, uh, you're going to give an application a name, you're going to give it a URL, and you're going to specify the type of application. From there, you get to define environments. Right? So you can define your uh, dev, the QA, and your production environments. This is very much like stages right, in API Gateway. Uh, and then you get to create releases. Right? So when you create a release, you just upload your binaries. Right? So if you have Java jars, or .NET assemblies, or MATLAB um, uh, models, you just upload those things. And we're going to take those things, and we're going to make them available on our infrastructure. Once that release is created, you can actually promote it into one of our environments. Right? And we follow a workflow. And a traditional workflow for us is to say, hey, you define your environments and then you link them together. So if you upload to dev, it stays in dev until you upload a new release. And then from there, once it's in dev, you can promote it into QA and promote it into production as well. So, this is what an um, application definition might look like. All right, so you have a name, a URL, uh, the type, as I mentioned before. Uh, one other thing that you'd be providing is a class name associated with your Java. So this is an example of using Java. Your method. And for versioning, we auto-increment, although you can override it. And the result of that is a service that is available at a particular URL. All right, so at the bottom, you can see that you know this hello world service. It lives in dev, and it's version one of that uh, URL or of that service. Um, creating release for us, we actually uh, use Docker, right? So if you go back to this cluster right here, this is all ECS running Docker images, and we'll we'll see a little bit more of that in a minute. Our Docker images, we're running Ubuntu. Uh, how many people are using Ubuntu in, in uh, Amazon? One person, two people, four or five? OK. Um, we're using it because uh, our customers are really using MATLAB, and we find that MATLAB uh, runs really well on Ubuntu. All right, so that's probably the primary reason why we're using it. Um, but there are other systems that we're looking at as well. But we take that Docker image, uh, we put down the OS, we lay down some services that we've created to expose your components. 
we put down your assets, all your jar files, your third-party components, and then finally we create an image. That image gets put into the EC2 container registry. We used to use Artifactory, and we're so glad that uh, they came out with the registry. That was very thankful. Um, but once that image is out there, it's immutable. It doesn't change. We can take that image, we can download it, we can run it locally if we want it, but we can also run it in the cloud, and it's there until you decide to delete it. Okay. So let's get into the architecture a little bit more. So originally, we looked at API Gateway, Lambda, and uh, SQS, right? Simple queue service. Uh, we really love the concept of serverless computing. Uh, we thought it was great. It fit a lot of our customer needs. <clears throat> uh, the customer, uh, very specifically, is a small financial shop. Uh, they don't like to spend money on anything other than you know, their paychecks. But uh, that being said, uh, we thought this was a great, uh, great thing for us. Unfortunately, uh, along the way, we had some challenges. Uh, first, we were trying to use SQS as a means to, to kind of be the broker for service discovery. We had workers that were running in Docker images, and we had um, uh, work that needed to be dispatched. And when we ran this, we found that uh, our initial connection latency with SQS was on the order of like 20 seconds. Now, that went away after the first time, but that first 20 seconds when you're doing hey, I just want to call into something, that's expensive, right? Especially when something takes, you know, six seconds, right? And then uh, from then on, we had a latency of approximately 200 milliseconds with SQS. Now, we were able to reduce it just a little bit, um, but, you know, these are what we ended up with. Now, in order to eliminate this performance, we really wanted to manage uh, some state. We wanted to keep... Uh, connections alive, we wanted to uh, keep some state in memory. And if you're familiar with Lambda, Lambda works really well in a stateless approach. And what we found is we couldn't get that consistent level of performance given that we wanted to do stateful programming. Yes? I'm just curious, but the 200 milliseconds latency, is that with the long calling approach? Yes, we did do the long calling approach, right? So, yes, um, that is a very good point. So, um, uh, while calling, what they do is they connect and they're waiting for something, right? So we were doing the long point, but remember, they have the stateless, right? So we couldn't guarantee that that would be around, right? So uh, the other thing, too, is we really wanted to use Lambda uh, as our front end, but the challenge we had is we would dispatch something to a worker, and that worker would need to call us back. And we would actually have to register a callback inside of Lambda, and that overhead was very complicated. So what we found is by doing all these things, we were kind of trying to do something that wasn't meant for, right? So <clears throat> what did we end up doing? Well, we scrapped all that, and we ended up building uh, two clusters, right? An ECS cluster for our service router and an ECS cluster for our workers, right? So the service router is actually dispatching work to items on the cluster. Um, so how do we do that? Has anybody heard of console? All right, so a lot of people in the room. So console is a really great service discovery uh, application from HashiCorp. Um, what we did is we took console and added it to our service router infrastructure and added it to our worker clusters. Um, our worker clusters are all running console in agent mode and our service routers are running them in uh, <coughs> server mode. What this is allowing us to do is use HashiCorp's console application to actually do discovery. Now, <clears throat> so you might be saying, well, what's this console thing, right? And when we had heard about it too, we were like, what is it? And we were trying to figure out what it was, and we had some friends that were using AWS, and they were like, you should absolutely use console. Well, what we found, which was very cool, console does all the communication and registers our services for us in a very distributed way. It has some communication protocols known as uh, consensus and gossip protocols that manage state 
between all the nodes in our cluster. So each one of these little orange boxes right here is considered a node, right? And these are nodes, these are nodes, all these things are nodes. So console is distributing all our state around this cluster for us. So it's doing it for us. We like that because before we were having to do a ton of development and we really didn't want to have to do that. Uh, now, <clears throat> some of the challenges we had though is because, because we had an SQS uh, queue in our previous architecture, we could actually say, hey, if a worker failed, that worker could talk to the queue. If it failed, the message wouldn't come off the queue and another worker would come along and pick it up. In the console world, that's a little bit different. Failure needs to be handled uh, very specifically. <coughs> um, so <clears throat> with console, you can actually have health checks. So we're actually providing health check system for our customers' components and making those health checks register with console so they can say, are you alive? Are you actively running? Are you doing something? Um, and are you in a healthy state? Yes. Yeah, so Sidecar check for, for the, yeah, because like we use console. To, to help but, yeah. Uh, yes, it's a sidecar. I, I mean, it's it's basically sitting there, and so you got you got something watching the app, and, and console's checking that. Yes, that's exactly what we're doing, right? Now, there's a few reasons why we do that, and which you'll understand a little bit later. Um, the other thing about console, which is kind of nice, is this key value store. Uh, we actually use it for mostly static metadata associated with services. Um, we're more interested in seeing if we can use it for more dynamic metadata with services, but uh, for right now we have things like location, dynamic ports, environments, those type of things of what you would expect, right? And we can query those things, right? So our service router, which is over here, is able to query on those things and discover where our services are running and actually do dispatch. Okay, service router. More not so good ideas. So I mentioned earlier some of the technologies we're looking to use for uh, this uh, for service discovery. In this particular case, we were looking for API Gateway and Lambda. However, we had a few challenges. Um, our customers have very large JSON payloads. Huge. It's shocking what they have. Right? And we looked at it and we said, well, can you reduce it? And they said, no. We said, okay. And we actually found that the payloads were actually causing performance issues. And we said, all right, let's go turn on HTTP compression. Mm, not so much. The next thing, we said, we want Java 7. Well, we went to go look at Lambda, and it was Java 8. Next thing, our customers' models were running in six to eight seconds, mostly six seconds. But if you look at the timeouts, the max timeout was 300, uh, 300 seconds. 300 seconds. Right? And then lastly, um, for our customer, they had JSON responses, but they also had binary uh, responses. So when we summed all these things up, you know, depending on whether it's API Gateway or Lambda, uh, the two just weren't fit, right? You know, they, they didn't support all these features. And then finally, um, you know, Mill 5 is both a Java, you know, .NET shop, right? We do, we do do a lot of .NET development, and we wanted .NET as a first class citizen in there. Uh, so uh, we felt that we had an impedance mismatch with, it, with these technologies. Um, it's not that we didn't like them, we really, really did like them, but uh, again, it was a 90% problem case, right? So, <clears throat> the service route. So, this is what's doing most of the heavy lifting for us on the front end, right? So, if you look at API Gateway today from Amazon, and you look at the feature list here, pretty much you're going to find a one-to-one -one correlation. Things like hey, can we authorize incoming requests? Oh, yes, right? 
we have a model where we can AP, have API keys and secrets, and our customers can actually register their car, uh, customers in our portal and provide them with their own API keys and secrets to call our services. Uh, the service router also routes requests. So this one's kind of interesting because this starts to get into uh, scheduler territory, right? So right now we're using ECS. And uh, our scheduling, we are doing some scheduling with ECS, but some of our scheduling is actually done by our service router, and we'll get into more details of that a little later. Um, but what it does right now is it breaks down the URL into the application version environment, and then looks up in console for an available service to call, and then makes that call. Uh, we are also tracking and reporting on metrics, right? Things like request per second, wait time, execution time, and more. Um, we actually track 200s, 400s, 500s, all the usual suspects. Uh, security measures, right? So things like rate limiting, blacklist, whitelist, right? We have a customer out on the, on the 495 now, they want to whitelist all their, all their services, right? So we need to be able to support that. <clears throat> Three other things, uh, advanced HTTP scenario. So um, we want to support caching, HTTP compression, and WebSockets. How many people are using WebSockets today? Yes, two people over there. No. So we really wanted to take it to the next level. Things that aren't necessarily fully supported um, in some of the uh, technologies we mentioned, like API Gateway and Lambda, we wanted to do on our own. And then finally, um, Several of our customers said, well, that's all great, you can do that, but I want to play it on premises. So they said, okay. And that's when we really understood that we need to build our own thing, because uh, we don't want to go do new development if we don't have to, but in this case, we felt we did. And then finally, there are some other things I can really talk about, but um, I'm hesitant to talk about the details. I'm happy to talk about it offline, but it has to do with scheduling, integration with ECS uh, of our service router. But um, just know that we're doing some work to integrate service router with ECS. So the container service. We love this thing. Right? This is container management for the cloud. Uh, it has uh, two out-of-the-box schedulers, a service scheduler and a task scheduler. Um, currently, we are using the service scheduler for our service router. Uh, we love that, right? So if you look back at the architecture here, this is another ECS cluster. Um, <clears throat> the fact that it integrates with Elastic Load Balancer, the fact that it integrates with CloudWatch and Autoscale, are all great things. These are things that we didn't have to go do ourselves, and we love that. Um, it really fit within Amazon's cloud architecture. Uh, also, what's great about their container service is that they support very robust programming interfaces, and we're leveraging that, right? So um, they actually have not only some APIs you can call them to into the cluster and get some information about what's going on, but they also have an extensible scheduler. And we are definitely taking advantage of that. All right, so <clears throat> custom scheduling. How many people work with MATLAB? Anybody in the room? One person. So one of the challenges with MATLAB is it takes about 30 seconds to start up, right? <laughs> Drives me nuts, right? Um, I actually helped them uh, develop uh, one of their products. But because of that 30 second startup, it kind of eliminates some of the things that we're trying to do. And we're actually reducing that startup and making it non visible to the end consumer of our services. They don't see this startup whatsoever. All right, so, yes, sir? The platform of fast DGI, where you pre and the data? Or? Um, we do kind of a look ahead instantiation of the service, right? And as part of that look ahead, 
that's some of the things we need to do in the scheduler, right, to, to have that look ahead. Yeah, a few long bodies already waiting and then you should do it. Sort of, right, but yeah, some, some, some people standing by is probably the, the best answer, but it's a lot more than that. So, um, the other thing, some, something we didn't talk highly about, I'm gonna get into on the next slide, how many people are using things like Swarm and Mesos and all that stuff? So I see one, two, right? <clears throat> Kubernetes. Kubernetes, yeah. So, you know, I like those products, but what I found, in our experience, you have to have a DevOps team that helps manage it. Yes, sir? Um, uh, MATLAB, are you running different people's jobs in the same MATLAB instance? Yeah. Okay. Not at all. In fact, um, just going back to this, we actually make this per application, right? So there's no sharing of infrastructure whatsoever, all right? All right, so, you know, when we're talking to a five-person, you know, hedge fund or um, some small shop that has a small technical team, they're not going to be able to take on things like Mesos, right? They, I think we'll just overwhelm them. Um, that being said, uh, we really like the APIs that uh, ECS provides, and we're hooking in the, into them to provide our own schedule. But what that means for us is we're going beyond just taking the Docker uh, and deploying it to a running EC2 container instance. We're actually going out there and deploying EC2 container instances, right? So um, part of that is to look at some of the things going on, right? Like costing algorithms. So if a customer says, hey, um, I want to minimize my cost on running this infrastructure, we're looking at those things. Um, if we're looking at the resources on the box and the request rate coming in, again, we're looking at those things and trying to adjust the cluster uh, to handle it. But we're going a little bit farther. We're going into things like high performance scheduling, right? So resource-based management. And we're looking at the applications as well for things like concurrency, right? So these are all things that we're putting into our scheduler uh, that our customers need, right? Uh, the goal there is to support not only the small, medium-sized clusters, but large clusters as well. And uh, our goal is to automate the management of this you know, completely, right? as much as possible. So <clears throat> I love this quote at the bottom. Uh, as I was writing the slide, I kept on thinking, we're really trying to science the heck out of it, right? So uh, we don't mind spending engineering thought towards solving these problems if it makes our customers' lives easier. So getting into the Kubernetes and Swarm and Mesos, as I mentioned, um, I found it was great for Facebook, Twitter, Google, very large companies. Um, but with EC2 um, and the container service, um, we have something that's cloud native. It's out of the box, fewer parts to manage. Um, our target isn't these large companies. Yes? You mentioned that some of your customers insist that local premises are important. Uh, how do you address that? We're going to work with the Docker guys all right, on that. Right? So they have some on-premises infrastructure that we're going to start development on early next year. Right? So, no, but for example, you say Kubernetes, you, you modify it, but that would have been a possibility. Right? You run Kubernetes on Amazon, you run Kubernetes on Amazon. Yeah, you know, and we could have used Kubernetes or Kubernetes or Mesos or any of these things. Um, we actually have a partnership with Docker and probably going to use that. Right? So, yeah. Um, so that being said, uh, our target for this was to really automate as much as possible. Get that IP out of the hands of these analysts and scientists and start making money on it, right? So uh, our target is small to medium businesses. Doesn't mean that we don't work with large businesses. We actually have one that we're, we're talking to about this product. Um, but our job is to enable small technical teams and uh, those that want more automation. So what we're trying to do is take all the best practices that you would have in AWS by using this piece, this piece, this piece, stitch them together so you don't have to do that, 
and just provide it out of the box. All right? So that's our goal. So <clears throat> what's next for us? The first plan release is in Q1 of 2017. Uh, we do have tons of functions and features still to come. Uh, batch requests for long-running executions. Uh, that's really <coughs> important for us. Uh, we have some customers that have long-running jobs. Um, payment system, right? So we're going to integrate a marketplace with this, right? So that as these uh, analysts and engineers and you know, entrepreneurs that expose this IP, they can start monetizing it, right? And we're going to provide them a customer portal where their customers can actually um, sign up. Talked to somebody earlier tonight about spot instance support. Our goal is to reduce costs as, as much as possible. So it definitely takes us down the spot instance route. And of course, more automation and management. All right. So finally, we are hiring, right? So developers, engineers, ops, people, uh, both for consulting and product development. Uh, these are just some of the technologies that we're working with. Java, Docker, AWS, AngularJS, .NET Core, um, console, of course. Uh, so certainly if you have experience in all these, come see us afterwards. Uh, I do ask, um, I didn't make this correct. Uh, this should be careers at mil5.com, not AWS Meetup, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll change that. We'll, we'll add the AWS Meetup tonight so that you can actually get uh, uh, your resumes in if you're interested. Um, so that being said, uh, now the giveaway from Cloud Academy. Does everybody have their business cards in in this thing here? Yes. All right. Your business cards. There you go. Anybody else? Down there? So how are you going to figure out how to, do you charge on a per request basis? <laughs> um, that is the predominant model that we want to do, uh, probably in batches, right? So things like for every 10,000 requests, uh, we want to be able to charge, right? So, so, so does so. the publisher name that price? Uh, yes, right? So um, our customers actually need to name a price um, for it, right? Because everything that they publish is going to have different value. Right? So somebody writing, say, a very quick email service or a zip code service or some simple thing, right? maybe some text search thing, um, that might be very small, but somebody that has financial algorithms that are actually making people money, they want to charge a lot more. Right? Uh, that's another thing, too. Um, uh, we're actually partnering with Bloomberg on this. And we're going to be posting this to the Bloomberg Marketplace at some point in the near future. Right? So when it goes live next year, we'll definitely be up on the Bloomberg Marketplace. So. Other questions? I, I deal with stuff like uh, more secure architecture. Like the customer, you know, I understand you want to deploy a, an artifact that contains the VNet too. But, uh, if, you want to, if you want to chain them together, or if you want to uh, persist data, where you persist data. Yeah, that is a challenge for us right now. Um, so uh, right now, most of our services are algorithm-based. Um, so we haven't been able to test that as much as we'd like. But we do expect to be able to deploy some of those things in customers' infrastructure. So like if they had, um, say, a Postgres database that they wanted to access, we want to be able to access those things as well. 
right? And so we are working on that, but uh, we're not done yet. So, uh, the person in the back. Yeah. Can Josh maybe try a different harmonization in terms of the Java instances, in terms of how much memory and CPU the buffer is? Yeah. And there's probably something where program has certain best cases, and sometimes the data set is actually determining what is best. What's the flow of that? So, right now we're um, statically allocating um, certain size machines, right? Uh, we do do overcommit, right, on some of the machines. Um, for a couple reasons, but um, right now we're statically allocating. Um, what's nice about it though is these are microservices, right? So a very defined thing. And you're right, you know, the performance of it does vary, but over time it's pretty consistent, right? So for us is to basically say, um, uh, you know, define it based on the application, right? Then there's one thing I can't tell you, but the best thing I can tell you is we are tracking every resource utilization for every execution. So you're learning and, and suggesting that. Yes. All right, we are doing it. Other, uh, you had a question, sir. Yes. Okay. Um, so for the QMP, I think clients are looking to do things like Apache uh, Spark, like you did uh, <laughs> yeah, um, not with this architecture, but we do have clients that are interested in this part. Uh, it's, uh, uh, but yeah. Bring away. Does your partnership with Docker revolve around Docker Swarm? Does, does your partnership with Docker revolve around Docker Swarm, or is it something else? Um, it's a little bit of something else, right? So, um, no, it, the, the idea here is yes, Swarm, but you know they have some on-premises stuff that they're bringing. Right, and have brought, right? We just haven't gotten into it yet. They've been wanting us to do it for some time, um, but we just haven't been able to engage them. We're a six-person company right now. So we've got to get this out the door, and then we'll engage them at the beginning of next year. So. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, as you think, I talked about that you're doing specialized uh, scheduling. Uh, I've written a scheduler. Uh, as well, one of the things that Amazon doesn't really provide for you support for is paying attention to how much time is left in the hour. <laughs> we are absolutely doing that, right? So that's, we, we, you you just nailed something that is a key point on our, our architecture, right? So just to let everybody know, um, one of the ways we try to keep costs down, we look at the EC2 instance and we determine how long it's been alive relative to everything else. And as our load goes down, we say, which EC2 instance should we get rid of, right? So we are absolutely doing that. And the idea there is to save on that hour with issue. But, they, but, but, but the trick is there's no point in getting rid of an instance. Even if your load is zero, if you've got, a, if you've got an instance that's been up for, you know. We don't get rid of it. Right, right. You don't get rid right. of it until you get within like a witching hour of the next charging hour. Yeah, we, we, I mean, if it, okay. we, we actually can go down. But we will decide not to go down if, I mean, because otherwise it would just cost us more, right? Because right. so you can get the spike right back up again. And yeah. You pay for the instance twice. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Right? Yeah, we don't want to pay for the instance twice. In fact, um, um, so early days, right? I mentioned I, I come from Microsoft original. Um, early days, we were looking at whether this should be on Azure or, or Amazon, and we chose Amazon. Um, we really like uh, Amazon's cloud. It's not to say Azure is um, bad or anything, but they have two different cost models. And this is one of our discussion points uh, when we were making that decision, because Azure is on a per minute, and Amazon is on an hourly basis, right? So uh, it did have impacts in how we do scheduling, so. Uh, with your scheduling learning uh, algorithms, do you find uh, any kind of hysteresis where um, the learning uh, drives uh, certain startup parameters to uh, a critical point? Uh, so, um, keywords not yet. All right, that leads into a question that the gentleman over here had about learning. Right, so right now we statically allocate based on what 
you know, we've seen with the customer when we onboard them um, what the EC2 instance size should be. Um, but things change over time. For example, if you deploy version one of the app, it might have a certain workload. Version two of the app is completely different. Oh, well, and that's my point is that um, our initial EC2 instance is more of an educated guess based on testing of what it should be. Um, but over time, we expect to learn and figure out what it actually should be. So. Other questions? And the on prem is actually the customers. Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Speak up. On the on prem side of it, it actually gets customized based on the workflows we deploy because the customer knows what they're going to be running. Um, the amount of infrastructure that we'd have to deploy for each service that we want to provide should be small to start, right? And then just grow based on demand, right? So, yes? Do you expect that most of your customers are going to want more for their own We don't do that yet, right? Um, right now, we'd ask our, the one customer that's actually running some of this right now, no, right? He he doesn't need any of that, but it's something we have to to do eventually. Right? So so the answer is yes, but you know, we'll we'll get there eventually. So. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Ashan, come see me. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. We don't have any other presentations this evening. So, feel free to network, uh, especially those of you that are, are looking for positions and those of you that are hiring.